This is Bible teacher Nelson Walters, and today we're discussing a topic that everyone has a theory about, but few have answers. When does the wrath of God begin in the midst of the 70th week of Daniel, and how long is it going to last? We're going to be looking at a very unusual source for our answer, the flood of Noah, because Noah's flood is a type or an analogy of the coming future eschatological wrath of God. You will probably be shocked to learn that the Old Testament actually has a lot to say about this question. Genesis' account of Noah and the flood, the book of Isaiah, the book of Daniel, and the organization of Jubilee cycles in the book of Leviticus all point to a divine pattern, a divine blueprint of sorts for how God organizes time and likely likely how he has planned and designed the 70th week of Daniel. Now, we need to be very clear that the Bible doesn't explicitly state where in the 70th week of Daniel the wrath of God begins. Traditional pre-wrath theory contends that the wrath of God could begin almost anywhere in the last three and a half years of a 70th week, anywhere from as little as a week after the midpoint to as late as five months prior to the end. The writings of its originators, Van Campen and Rosenthal, did not address this question. Rather, they left it vague. But we have a theory about it. Let's begin with Noah and the narrative of the flood because the flood itself is a type or a picture of God's wrath. Jesus was very clear in both Luke 17 and Matthew 24 that the days of Noah would be like the days before his coming. So the flood narrative is an Old Testament account that parallels the return of Jesus. It's a type or an analogy of Jesus' return. This includes what people were doing prior to the flood, God's protection of the righteous, and the punishment of the unrepentant in the flood. The Apostle Peter states this really clearly. The earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these... The world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by that same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. 2 Peter 3, 5-7 In this passage, Peter compares the coming future wrath of God to the initial wrath of God, the flood. The first one punished the wicked by water, the latter one will by fire. So a rather tight comparison is being made by the Apostle Peter. This makes the ark a symbol of the rapture, which lifts the righteous above the wrath of God, which takes place below their feet. As it states in Psalm 47, 3, he has subdued people under us and nations under our feet. And that analogy makes the Ark Encounter in Kentucky an absolutely wonderful site for a conference. Now, in addition to the last day's overcomers holding conferences in Cincinnati, Arkansas, and Minneapolis this summer, as we just announced, a friend of ours and a great Bible scholar, Dr. Alan Kirshner, had the brilliant, and I think it is absolutely brilliant idea, of holding a conference at the Ark Encounter. It will feature Alan and Ken Ham founder of Answers in Genesis. The conference will be May 19th through 20th, and there's a link down in the description. If you're in that area or would like to travel there, I think it would be a wonderful event to attend, one with two of the top Christian speakers in America. Now, back to the wrath of God. Discussing it is a really uncomfortable topic for some. They ask, why would a righteous and loving God inflict his wrath on anyone? Well, the real question should be, why wouldn't God inflict his wrath on everyone? We all deserve God's wrath. We all have sinned and made a complete mess of the world God created to be a perfect paradise. Think how we've treated those around us, all of them created in the image of God. Only the shed blood of Jesus saves us from that fate. But despite that amazing grace he showed us, there will be those who reject our God and the atoning sacrifice he made, those who continue in the vileness of human trafficking, 
drugs, terrorism, murder, torture, abuse of children, abuse of all kinds. God cannot restore the world back to an Eden-like paradise unless he puts an end to such things. But right now, God is being patient toward them, not willing that any should perish, 2 Peter 3.9. Just as he was patient with you and me, that's why he isn't eliminating those who commit horrible sins like trafficking right now. He is patiently waiting for all of those who will be saved to be saved. But one day, he's going to say enough, and the day of the Lord will come. As we said, believers will be saved from the wrath to come, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, and they're rescued in a rapture. In the account of Noah, that rapture is depicted as the ark, while the flood itself is a symbol of the final eschatological wrath, which Peter tells us will be fire instead of water like it was the first time. Jesus explained it this way, For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day, just as it was in the days of Noah. So it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Luke 17 24, 26 through 27, Jesus tells us that prior to his wrath being poured out, the unrepentant will be living relatively normal lives, eating, drinking, marrying. This is the main takeaway from this analogy. But is it the only one? This passage contains a major clue from Jesus about when he returns to rapture the saints. It's going to be like lightning where every eye sees him. So, in the Noah account, Jesus is not talking about a secret, invisible rapture, but a very visible rescue, like lightning seen all over the world. And based on this passage, Jesus says the unrighteous will be living relatively normal lives prior to that rescue. So, it also has to be before a single trumpet or bold judgment. During the trumpet and bull judgments, fire and brimstone are going to fall. Demon locusts will sing the unrighteous and make them just long for death. Yet Jesus says the unrighteous will be living normal lives before his return. This is only possible then if things like fire and brimstone and demon locusts haven't been unleashed yet. So the return of Jesus has to be before the trumpets are blown. It is the only way scripture makes sense. But one question nearly everyone asks at this point is, hey, hey, wait a minute. I can understand that the unrighteous won't be able to live normal lives after the trumpets begin. But what about the time during the seals and the great tribulation? Won't it be impossible to live normal lives then? I mean, it will be the greatest time of persecution and distress the world has ever seen. Good question. This will probably come as a shock to most But the unrighteous will most likely live relatively normal lives during the Great Tribulation. They'll take the mark of the beast and be eating and drinking normally. Only Christians and some Jews will starve and be persecuted. It will be Great Tribulation for them, but not for the unrighteous. The Apostle Peter clearly tells us that judgment begins with the house of God. 1 Peter 4.17 The righteous endure difficulty first. The unrighteous will be those who say peace and safety prior to the return of our Lord, while the righteous are enduring tough times. It isn't peace and safety for the righteous. Then the tables turn. After the return of the Lord, it's the unrighteous who are punished. So because the return of Jesus must take place before the trumpet and bowl judgments, We know it doesn't come at the end, as so many think. But how long before the end does this take place? Remember, the fifth trumpet alone is five months long. So if the fifth trumpet is that long, all the trumpets have to start blowing at least five months before the end. If we look at the events of the first wrath of God, the flood, perhaps we can get a clue. I first became aware of this clue in a wonderful book, called The Last Shofar 
by my good friends Dr. Joseph Lenard and Donald Zoller. In that book, the authors calculate the exact number of days Noah was in the ark during the flood, and they summarize that if the days of Noah are like the days of the Son of Man, just as Jesus tells us, then the number of days in the first wrath might be equal to the number of days of the coming second wrath, the eschatological wrath of God. It's an interesting idea. In Genesis, God tells us precisely when the flood started. Why does he do that? Is it a clue? Well, perhaps. Here is what the scripture says. The flood started on the 17th day of the second month, and it also tells us when Noah left the ark, in the second month, on the 27th day of the following year. So Noah was in the ark exactly one year and 10 days. Why does God give us this precise timing as we asked before? Is it possible that this is also how long the coming wrath of God by fire and brimstone will last? That is Lenard and Zoller's theory. And this evidence from Genesis is actually stronger than any other current theory for the length of God's wrath because all the other theories have zero evidence. But let's see what else the Bible has to say about this because there's more. In Daniel 9, 24 through 27, one of the most famous passages in the entire Bible, we learn that 70 weeks are established for Jerusalem and Daniel's people. These weeks are seven-year-long sabbatical cycles of years. That's how we know the 70th week of Daniel is seven years long. It's one of those cycles of years. But what most don't know is that the final year of this cycle of seven years is different from the other six. In Leviticus, we learn, For six years you will sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its fruits. But in the seventh year, there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the land. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. Leviticus 25, 3-4. The seventh year of the cycle is a Sabbath year, just like the seventh day is a Sabbath day. This seventh year is called the Shemitah year. So the last year of each and every seven-year sabbatical cycle is different than the first six, meaning that the last year of the 70th week of Daniel is going to be different from the first six as well. God's people will not be sowing or reaping their fields in that year. Well, how is this going to be? What, what, what does this mean? Well, if this is speaking symbolically of reaping and sowing in God's vineyard, the vineyard of souls, evangelizing in other words, when will evangelizing end in the 70th week? Why? Probably at the rapture, of course. So might the rapture happen in the seventh or final year of the 70th week? That is the theory. And it matches Lenard and Zoller's theory, as we'll soon see. The year prior to a jubilee year is a special year. It isn't a year long like every other civil Jewish year. It is a year and 10 days long. Most Hebraic civil years begin on Rosh Hashanah, Tishri 1. But Jubilee years begin on Yom Kippur, Tishri 10. And it makes sense that the year after the 70th week of Daniel would be one of those Jubilees. <laughs> if there was ever a reason for a Jubilee, the defeat of Satan and the world system is that reason. So, if the year before it is a Shemitah year, it will be one year and 10 days long. Wow, just like Noah's flood. That is the second piece of very strong evidence for Lenard and Zoller's theory. A year and 10 days is a very specific length of time. It's not some random length of time as it appears to be in the Noah account. The correlation of these two numbers is incredible to say the least. Well, is there more evidence? In the book of Isaiah, there are three other passages that seem to indicate the wrath will be a year long. In Isaiah 34, 8, we read, The Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. It says that God has a day of vengeance, the day on which wrath starts, and that his recompense, or 
payback for what the unrepentant did to Zion will take about a year. That also fits with this theory. In Isaiah 63, 4, that phrase about a day of vengeance and a year is repeated. In the three previous verses in Isaiah 63, Isaiah described the return of Jesus where he stains his garments with the blood of his enemies as one treads the winepress. It's a picture of the wrath of God. After this, it says, For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. In this verse, the day of vengeance is associated with another year-long time period when God will accomplish redemption. He's going to save someone probably mostly the unsaved Jews, during this time, in addition to pouring out his wrath. Then there is a third verse associated with the day of vengeance and a year. In Isaiah 61, 2, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. This one was quoted by Jesus during his public ministry. This time, the day of vengeance is associated with a year of favor, Who's being favored while others are being punished? Why, the church, who are raptured into heaven while punishment happens beneath their feet. So, there are five separate witness passages that we just gave you that provide some evidence or clues that the wrath of God is about a year long, maybe a year and ten days, as suggested by the length of Noah's flood. This theory isn't assured like our salvation is, but it's our best guess given what Scripture has to say. Yet, I bet very few of our listeners have heard about this theory. It's one we presented in my book, Rapture Case Closed, back in 2016. That's because 99% of Christians are arguing about whether the return is at the beginning in a pre-trib rapture or at the end in a post-trib rapture, when the correct answer probably is neither, if that's accurate. It explains why pre-trib and post-trib arguments go nowhere and are never resolved. This may also explain Jesus' statement. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of God is coming at an hour you do not expect. Unless you're listening to this teaching, this is a day and hour that no one expects. Now, as we just said, One year and ten days is a very precise length of time. Some of you may have noticed and wondered aloud, how can that be true? And at the same time, Jesus come at a day and hour that no man knows. How can we know and not know the timing of Jesus' return? The 70th week ends on Yom Kippur like many scholars theorize. Then a year and ten days earlier would be Rosh Hashanah. A known date, right? So that that can't be right. Well, that would be mostly true if we had a perfect understanding of the way God tells time. There are at least three biblical calendars. The current Hebraic calendar is based on solar lunar calculations. There is a biblical calendar based on natural observations also of the barley and the moon. And Then the ancient Essenes used a calendar found in Enoch. So that's three, at least three. The days and hours of the holidays, like Rosh Hashanah, found in each calendar are different. They celebrated them on different days. Did you ever notice that Jesus ate the Last Supper and called it a Passover a day earlier than the rest of Israel in the Gospels? It's possible he wasn't using the same calendar as the Pharisees. It's possible they didn't know the correct day and hour of Passover because their calendar was wrong. Adding to this confusion about calendars is that the sighting of the new moon necessary to announce Rosh Hashanah can happen on any one of two days and that at any hour of the night. So even if the return of Jesus is the holiday Rosh Hashanah, we don't know the day or hour today. We only know the name of the day, and we're guessing on the day and hour. Now, you might also ask, why are you even worried about end time stuff at all? If no one knows the day or hour, then it might be a thousand years from now, in addition to what you're suggesting. Well, click right here to keep watching 
and discover how we can know if we are the generation who will see Jesus coming on the clouds. Till then, this is Nelson, and I'll see you there.